Welcome back, Pipers. Hobbiton Piper Kevin here, coming to you from the heartland of America in Missouri. This is part two of our How to Cellar Pipe Tobacco series. And if you missed part one, I would love it if you would just pause this video, and a link is in the description for the part one video. Go watch that first, and then come back, and we'll continue on together with part two. This series is for those who want to store their tobacco long term. For them to either purposefully age that tobacco or just because they want to make sure they have enough of their favorite tobaccos moving forward in the future and want to go ahead and buy those now while prices are low or lower anyway than they will likely be in the future and storing those properly so hopefully you've all watched part one now let's continue on now with part two and i want to start with a question and answer section because several good questions came in uh, regarding the content from part one so let's just go through those and I'll answer each of those so one of them was about plastic bags what about what about storing tobacco in plastic like these Ziploc bags for example and anytime you're talking about those types of bags and even the one pound bags that you buy from Sutliff or McBaron, for example, these are just not sufficient for long-term storage. Um, you want a good airtight seal for your tobacco storage. And in my opinion, you very much need to move the tobacco out of that plastic and get it into a mason jar, preferably, although there may be some other options that you can consider as well, but I certainly prefer the mason jar option. Now, you say, okay, well, what about vacuum sealing loose tobacco? And that is a fair question. I know that many of you do this. You will, instead of putting your tobacco in mason jars, you will actually vacuum seal that loose tobacco directly into a vacuum sealed bag. So, let me tell you why I don't do that. And again, this is just my personal preferences. Everything about this is pros and cons, right? And some of the benefits to doing that is that you don't have to buy a bunch of jars and you don't have to find space to store all those jars. But there are some significant cons to me in vacuum sealing loose tobacco. And I'll give you three. So the first one is i found that it often completely changes the blender's originally intended presentation of that tobacco um, because it's always compressing it, right? It compresses that tobacco when you vacuum seal it into what eventually becomes this, this thin patty <laughs> of tobacco compressed inside that vacuum seal. And yes, you can take it out and you can rub it out. And a lot of times it's, it's just fine. But certainly if the blender's intention was to provide you with a nice fluffy ribbon cut of tobacco, um, that's not what you're getting once you vacuum seal it up. Now, another reason is because if you'll notice, you can often still smell that tobacco through the vacuum seal bag. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, you're not gonna find that in a, in a, you're not gonna smell anything out of a, a mason jar. So if you open up a drawer full of vacuum sealed tobacco bags, you're gonna smell that. Uh, you're not gonna smell anything when you open up a, dra a drawer, or very little anyway, <laughs> if anything, a drawer full of, of mason jars. So that to me tells me that, you know, something's escaping there, right? That's not escaping from a mason jar. So that's the second reason. The third reason though, is for any heavily topped or cased blends that you vacuum seal, that constant direct compression from vacuum sealing, it can literally turn those blends into a goopy sticky mess. <laughs> 
I'll give you an example. I, uh, I was gifted a vacuum sealed sample of Orlick Dark Strong Kentucky, for example. And when I took the scissors to it and opened that up and pulled out that patty, <laughs> it was literally so sticky that it felt like glue. It felt like there was glue on it from, from being compressed like that for so long. And when you open up a, a tin of Orlick Dark Strong Kentucky, it's not like that at all. So it can literally change the tobacco over time. So these are things that bother me about it, but they may not bother you at all. You may be completely fine with those things and you may say, well, that may be true, Kevin, but I like the minimal space where I can just stack those up and not have to worry about jars. And that's cool. Everybody's different. I'm just providing you with options and kind of telling you what's out there and then you can make your own decisions as to as to what you enjoy the most. So what was the next question? Can you vacuum seal entire tins? Well, absolutely. Here's one right here that I did to show you. You could vacuum seal an entire tin and this metal tin can withstand that pressure of the vacuum seal and not affect the tobacco inside whatsoever. Um, I prefer though, as I told you in part one, to use parafilm. And you can't even tell I've done anything to this, to this tin, can you? <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. As opposed to all of the extra material here and space that it would take to store these, these I can just stack up normally. But it is completely sealed with the parafilm all the way around. And you may say, well, yeah, Kevin, but is that parafilm as good as the vacuum seal bag? Well, that leads me to the next question. I was emailed a great question. And that question was, quote, I was looking into parafilm M on Amazon and noticed it says it allows gas permeability. Could that be a concern for oxygen getting through or letting out gases in aging of tobacco? So that's a great question. And I know that even the vacuum sealed bags, while they retain moisture and their seal, some gas does escape from that bag. So I gave this question to one of my engineer buddies and put him on the case for us. And he got back to me with a definitive answer. And this is what he said. Now, I don't understand all this. This is very technical, but I'll share it with you. He said, quote, the OTR, oxygen transmission rate for parafilm, is 150 cc slash M dash D, where an average high density polyethylene bag, such as used in Food Saver, is around 400. After doing the units conversion from OPC, oxygen permeability coefficient, to OTR, I can conclude that parafilm is two to three times better in both oxygen transfer and moisture retention than the average high density polyethylene food storage bag. Another question came in talking about dark amber and purple mason jars, because those will actually block out 99% of UV rays. And the thing is, if your jars are out in the light, then you likely probably need to look into that option. But if you're storing your tobacco in the dark, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, then that's really not an issue. So for example, this jarred tobacco here, at any time, I can pick this jar up and I can look and I can see, hey, is it, is it darkening properly? Uh, do I see any issues at all with, with mold, for example, or, or anything that I need to address for a darker Vapor, for example, I can look and see, hey, do I see any sugar crystals that are developing yet? And I never have to disturb the tobacco to determine that. Whereas if this was a dark jar, I would either have to just not know or, or open it. And anytime you open a jar that you're specifically aging, uh, you are changing the environment inside of that jar, the fermentation process. 
and you're basically forcing that environment to start all over when you seal it back up. So you want to be uh, very deliberate in, as to when you open your jars that you're aging. So I think there are applications where dark mason jars are appropriate. And then I think for a lot of us, uh, the clear ones would be a better option. So you have to wrap it properly, as we've been talking about, with the jars and the parafilm and the vacuum sealing. Um, but you also have to sit it somewhere proper then for it to age. And that leads us to three things, temperature, humidity, and light. So let's talk first about temperature. Now, ideally, based on my research, somewhere between 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, keeping it constant in that range would be ideal. Now, most of us don't have an actual cellar where we can walk down into it and it stays that constant temperature. But I can tell you that we personally keep our home inside somewhere between 65 and 75 degrees year round, uh, just depending on our preference that month. So I consider that for me and my purposes sufficient. So I make sure that all of my tobacco is stored indoors inside the house where I know it's gonna be between 65 and 75 degrees. Now, beyond that now, you have to think about potential humidity issues. Over time, humidity can cause some threats to the seal of your tobacco and, and, and it could potentially cause corroding if it got extreme enough, but I haven't taken my cellar to that level of actually monitoring the humidity, but some do. But a very important aspect beyond temperature is light because we need to be storing our tobacco in a dark place. Um, limiting that light exposure it's going to protect your containers. It's going to protect your tobaccos because it's protecting the container. And it's also going to help regulate the temperature to keep things cool in that range that we want. So, you know, keeping your tobacco out in a storage shed outside where it gets really hot in the summer and really cool in the winter or in a garage where it does the same thing, that's not ideal for your, for your tobacco collection. Um, so we want to try to keep things in that range of ideally 60 to 70. I keep it between 60 and 65 and 75 because that's what my home is conditioned to. And then I keep mine, you don't have to get fancy with this. Some people use cardboard boxes, some people use plastic bins, um, some people use a chest of drawers, but you just want to keep it out of the sunlight, keep it out of the light in, in a cool dark place. Um, now some, they'll actually buy coolers where they will be able to regulate a constant cool temperature year round for their tobaccos. I don't take it to that level, but you could. So all of these are options. All of these are things to consider. The pop top tins, like you would find with Cornell and Deal. and the paint can style tins that you would find with Peter Heinrich. Are they safe to just leave alone and just stack in your cellar? I think some of them are. I think that for those that are metal like this and inside have this food grade liner, do you see that? That's about as good as you can get. That's what McClellan used. That's what C&D uses. That's what GLPs uses. And they're excellent. And many people just leave these alone and have no issues with them for decades. There are others that are not quite so good. Paper walls in many cases, and uh, they don't have the food grade liner inside. And what that can do is, over time, uh, that can potentially cause for rust issues as the tobacco interacts with that metal. 
um, and the paper walls can break down. So it's generally accepted by those in the know that somewhere within five years, you likely need to remove that tobacco from those types of tins and get that into a mason jar, for example. So I think in a lot of cases you can leave your pop top tins alone, but for some of the um, less high grade tins, pop top tins and some of the paint cans as well, um, depending on how they're structured, you may want to move some of that out and get it into a jar. Okay, so let's review, and then I'll tell you about one more storage option that you have that we haven't discussed yet. So, for all my loose tobacco, I use mason jars. It's gonna have the airtight seal, it's gonna have the, the lid that locks down on top of it, and it's made of glass. You can't beat a mason jar. As my engineer friend said, anything divided by infinity is zero. <laughs> so, this is the best. Now for my tins, I use parafilm, which I showed you in part one. I use it for my square tins, I use it for my rectangle tins, and I use it for my round tins. It provides an excellent seal, and it's basically unnoticeable and clear. It's very easy to remove though. Just get your fingernail underneath where it attached, and you can pull it right off. Now, it's not reusable. It's lost its elasticity now, and it's it's a one-time use deal. So, to reseal this now, I'll cut me a new strip and apply it like I showed you in part one. Now, for my pouches and bags that I want to keep in their original packaging, that's when I use the vacuum sealer. And I'll use it for my pouches, and I'll use it for my bags. For your pop-top tins, or your paint can tins. If they are a high grade metal tin with the food grade liner inside that I showed you, I think you're good to go to just leave these alone. Uh, check them on occasion, make sure that the, the pop top is still intact. Uh, they will expand sometimes, but very rarely will they break. So just, just check them on occasion. Then that reminds me that for your mason jars, make sure you check those on occasion, on occasion, just make sure that they're tight. Tighten those down. And check your parafilm seals on occasion too. Make sure nothing is split, everything's still intact. You should be good to go there. Now for your pop tops and paint can style that are not of high grade quality, maybe they have paper walls, maybe they don't have the food grade liner, that's the ones that you need to Make sure that you move into a mason jar probably somewhere before the five-year mark. And if you just really, if you say, Kevin, I just really want to keep the original packaging for this, you might try vacuum sealing the entire thing. And that's probably your next best bet. So if you came to me, though, and you said, Kevin, I... I understand jars are the best, but I don't want to buy a bunch of mason jars. I don't want to have to store all those jars. I want a bag solution. What is the ultimate bag solution for me to use? That's when I would point you to Mylar. Now, I don't have any Mylar to show you other than an Esoterica bag, which is inside of here. That's Mylar. But the Mylar applications that I see used at home are the silver solid bags. And scientifically, those are a hundred times better in terms of ox oxygen transfer and uh, moisture retention than a food saver bag, for example. So it likely is going to require additional equipment. I know that my little vacuum sealer in here could not seal a Mylar bag. It's not strong enough. Um, you're going to have to have the right equipment for it. You're going to have to have those Mylar bags. Uh, but that's certainly an option for you if you want the ultimate in bag storage. It's not going to be the jar, but if you don't want to use jars, Mylar is the ultimate in bag solutions. Now, I don't use it 
for a couple of reasons. One, because I vacuum seal very few things. All my loose tobacco goes in a jar, and the only things I vacuum seal are the pouches and the bags that I want to keep in their original packaging. And I like to see what's inside of that. So for my purposes, it's not cost justified for me to you know, purchase Mylar and Mylar equipment for those couple of applications. But if you don't want to use mason jars, that's going to be your top of the line bag solution. I hope that this two-part series so far has been informative and enjoyable. As long as you use something that we've talked about and you put that in a cool, dry, dark place, I believe that for years to come, your tobacco is going to be in great shape when you're ready to smoke it or sell it or trade it. Until we talk again, go enjoy some good food, good drink, and a good pipe. Thank <laughs> you.